by singing hymn number 175 in our hymnals. It's O Lord, Our Lord, and I would ask you to stand as we sing 175. O oh Lord, our Lord, we praise you for your mercy. O oh Lord, our Lord, we praise you for your love. For every grace your kindness has provided. To every soul who calls upon your name. For every grace your kindness has provided. To every soul who calls upon your name. O Lord, our Lord, enthroned in highest heaven. O Lord, our Lord, enthroned in grateful hearts. Your love extends to every generation. With joyful news of your redemption plan, your love extends to every generation. With joyful news of your redemption plan. O Lord, our Lord, we praise you for your mercy. O Lord, our Lord, we praise you for your love. For every grace your kindness has provided, to every soul who calls upon your name. For every grace your kindness has provided to every soul who calls upon your name. Then back just a couple of pages to hymn number 167 is, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Let's sing this fun chorus. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. O Most High again. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Good singing tonight. We do want to ask God's blessings on the service, on this offering. Brother Gene Thomas, do you mind to pray for us? Amen. You may be seated. And we're going to sing through a couple more hymns of thanksgiving and praise. Uh, we're going to start on 513, one that uh, probably many of you just love. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let's sing that together. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. 
Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free again. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free and then back on hymn number 173 is a beautiful song called i'm forever grateful and we're going to do the chorus to that let's sing it together and i'm forever grateful to you i'm forever grateful for the cross I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. Good job. Let's try it again. And I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. That's better. Let's try it one more time. And I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. Great job tonight. Pastor Pete. Well, I am grateful for a great God who loves us, Amen. came to seek and to save us. Uh, one note, uh, I, I appreciate John and Angie uh, showing up. They uh, have been here pretty much all day uh, in the fellowship hall, getting, uh, re receiving shoeboxes and things of that sort, packing them up, getting ready to go on to the trailer. Uh, they said that we, John said we, they, they received more today than they did all this past week. Uh, I think Angie said 700 uh, came in. So uh, we need some help tomorrow at noon loading those onto the trailers. Uh, and then there's more coming at noon tomorrow to be put on the trailer. So if you are able to help at noon, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we have come to... Towards the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4, we have come through uh, Paul's final charge in verses 1 to 4, uh, and we are now at the final crown. We see the final crown, and these are really Paul's last words to Timothy. He says, hey, Timothy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of give you my last words, and then there, there's, there's a little bit more to discuss still in the book, but here's really the final thought of Paul's life. So we're going to be looking at that tonight. Last words are important, and these are really Paul's last words. His final commitment on all that he has done and all that he has faced, we will see tonight. So let's read through uh, this section, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course on I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, 
and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we look at Paul's final words here, that we would grasp all that he has, has been through, all that he has experienced, and the fact that his faith never wavered. He is a great man that we can emulate today and and in hearing his final words, strive to make those our final words as well. So when we reach the end of this life, we can, like Paul said, we have, we have kept the faith. and We are ready to go, ready to hear those wonderful words of well done, good and faithful servant. May we be challenged, may we be encouraged, may we be changed, be like Christ tonight. We praise in Christ's name, amen. So we see uh, Paul's, the, the final crown, we see first his, his acknowledgement. Verse 6, he, he kind of makes an acknowledgement. It's, it's almost like he's come to this point and he says, okay, I suppose I should actually acknowledge I'm not going to make it out of this one. He's writing to Timothy, he says, Timothy, God's able to do anything, but I'm probably not going to make it out of this one. He's in the Mamertine prison, as we've talked about before. He's in Rome. He's already seen Nero once, most likely. And at this point, he's saying, Timothy, it's soon. I'm not going to survive very long, so make sure that you... Uh, Come soon. He says that later in the chapter. But he acknowledges it. He says, you know what? I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered up just, just like, well, an offering. Paul says, I've, I've lived my life for Christ. I have, I've done everything I could for Him. It's all for Him and His glory. And with that in mind... I'm ready to make that final offering to Him. I'm ready to be that lamb of sacrifice for Him. I'm ready to be that, that drink offering poured out for Him. I'm ready to be that, that grain offering that's lifted up and waved before the Lord. I'm ready to be that burnt offering of my entire life being consumed for Christ. He says, I'm ready. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good statement. It's the, the acknowledgement of, I've done everything I could. I have finished everything that God has set for me. I'm ready. That's, um, that's quite the statement. That's quite the acknowledgement. I'm now ready to be offered up. The time of my departure at hand, is at hand. Paul acknowledges that it's not going to be long and uh, we, we see him kind of talk about this before in, in Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, 20 to 24. Paul talks about his departure, if you will. He says, according to my earnest expectation, my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul says, I want to glorify, I want to magnify, I want to be a giant magnifying glass with my life, so that whether I live, Christ is magnified, or if I die, Christ is magnified. In either one of those, Christ will be made greater through my life, through me. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What, a, what an amazing statement. We often hear that, to live is Christ and to die is gain, but Stop and consider that. He says, if I live, it's Christ. It's not me, it's Christ. And I get to proclaim him before everyone around me. So really, I'm dead either way because I'm dead to Christ, as we looked at in Colossians chapter 3. But to die... To be done with this world, to be done with the pain and the sorrow and the sin, oh, that is gain. How could, I mean, how could we ever fear death as a Christian? Christ has passed through death for us. It has no sorrow, no pain, no fear for us. We know where we will go. We will be with Christ forever and ever and ever. 
to, to die is gain. So then in light of all that Paul has been through and when he challenges us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, thou therefore endure hardship, hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, what's the worst, worst the world could do to us? The absolute worst that the world could do to us is keep us here. To keep us suffering here in this sin-torn body. Because they say, oh, well, we're going to kill you. Okay, gladly. I'll accept that for Christ. Because if I die, it's for gain. It is, I'm with Christ forevermore. That holds no fear for me. Verse 22 of Philippians chapter 1. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I wot not. I, I love that, that wot not. I, I don't know what I'm going to choose. What I would prefer. Verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. That's what he's writing to the Philippians. This was during his first imprisonment in Rome. And he's later released from that and goes on his way and goes back to Ephesus for a while. But he's writing to the Philippians says, Philippians, I, I, I don't know which one I, I really want better. To, to live and to be here is, is necessary for you, but to die and be with Christ is, is far better. I don't have to worry about sin anymore. I don't have to suffer. I don't have to experience pain. I don't have to endure the hardness of the world for Jesus Christ. And he's, like, he's torn. He's pulled between the two. Say, well, to be with Christ or, or, or to be here and teaching you, it's a hard thing. But here in 2 Timothy, Paul says, you know what? My time's at hand. I know I've done everything I can. I acknowledge that, that it's here. That soon it's not going to be I'm torn between two anymore because the decision will be made for me. I will be with Christ. And that is far better. So in saying, I am, I am now ready. I will make even the final sacrifice and I will give my life as a martyr for Christ. But there's joy in that. There's joy because he's saying, I'm going to be with Christ. No longer in this body, but by my Savior forever. And the time of my departure is at hand. That's Paul's acknowledgement. B, we see Paul's accomplishments. Paul's accomplishments in, in, chapter, in, in chapter 4, verse 7, he lists off three things. He says, I have fought a good fight. fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He says, first, he has he is fought. He has fought the good fight. He's, he's fought and it's been, a, it's been a good fight. He has struggled. He has faced every opponent and fought them tooth and nail. Whatever it took to get the gospel out, he has fought. If you can say that anybody fought for the gospel of Christ, it is Paul. He has gone to all lengths, bur bury, uh, carried burdens. He has experienced hardship. And he has fought. What about us? Are we, are we fighting the good fight of faith today? When we come to the end of our life, will we be able to say, I fought most of the times? Or are, are, are we going to have to say, well, I tried and not really. I, I kind of let things slide and I never really stood up for Christ. And if somebody was talking about about religious things, I, I kind of kept my mouth shut and I didn't really contend. I just kind of sat there on the sidelines and let things happen. Or are we going to be like Paul and say, I have fought. I have fought and it's been a good fight. Football games are, are, are I mean, it's this time of year for football games and uh, it, it's always encouraging to hear a, a good blowout for your team. Um, I forget where we were going last weekend. Uh, Stephen and I were, were traveling around in the, in the truck last weekend and uh, we 
we were hearing the Liberty game on the radio, and they, they won handily. Uh, large, large score difference, and uh, it, it, was, it was fun to hear. But there's something about those close games, isn't it? In watching the Super Bowl especially, you, it, it's great when your team's up, but the best games are when it's back and forth coming right down to the wire and you're on the edge of your seat biting your nails. Are they going to pull it out in the end? Are they going to do it? Is it a good fight? That's, that's a good fight. And that's what Paul was saying here. He said, I have, I have, it's not been a blowout. It was a challenge every step of the way. It was a fight to the finish. And I've done it all. I have accomplished what does he say in Ephesians chapter 6? I always love this passage in, in the, the lead up to the uh, armor of God. Uh, Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I love verse 13. It says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. That's all we're called to do on the battleground, is we armor ourselves and we stand there. And I always, I always like how it just ends that verse, and having done all to stand. Can you see the war-torn soldier? He's got his shield, he's got his sword, he's got his, his helmet and his chest plate, his belt of righteousness and his feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he's been through it. His armor is dented. He's taken some blows. He's bruised. He's wearied. But at the end of the day, he's still standing. Because it's not his strength. It's the Lord's strength. He's standing. That's Paul. He says, I have been through the battle. I have fought with everything that I have. I'm standing. I have been through the evil day. And I'm still standing through the power of Christ. He says, I have fought the good fight. He has fought first. He is second. He is finished. He has finished I have fought a good fight I have finished my course he said God has laid out a path a trail for me to go throughout this life and I started there on the road to Damascus and all through the rest of my life I have finished my course I've gone where God has called me to go and Paul went he went everywhere he, do you realize he was the first one that we know of to preach the gospel on the European continent? Looking around us tonight, most of us would benefit, are, are the beneficiaries of that preaching. Most of us have European ancestry. It is because Paul heard that Macedonian call and traveled there that we have the gospel today. The pilgrims that we celebrate this week, well, celebrate with them, I should say, that, that they gave the first Thanksgiving, they came with the good news of the gospel because Paul took it to the European continent. We're the recipients of that. He said, I have finished my course. He has fully run the race. He did not quit in the middle. Sure, he got tired. He got tuckered out. He probably wanted to give up a time or two, but he kept going. I'm sure there were times where he woke up in the morning and said, I am so tired. I'm so sore. My body has not yet recovered from the last beatings. God, do we really have to do this again? Do we have to go to that next city? Do we have to face those people there with the gospel? And I know the response because their response is the same as every other city I've been in. They'll hear it for a time and then they're going to rise up against me and beat me, throw me in jail and throw me out of the city. Do we have to do this again, God? But you know what Paul did every day? He sat up in the morning 
got his running sandals on, laced them up, and he kept going. He finished the course. He didn't give up halfway through. He finished. I have finished my course. What is it that God is is calling you to do? What is it that God is saying, you know what, you're not done yet. You've got this another bend to go around. You've got these, this many more miles to face. So bear up under that burden. Take courage. Find your strength in me because we're going to make it through this. What is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. We've got those witnesses all around us. Those that have gone on before us in this faith. We see them, many of them listed in chapter 11. The hall of fame of faith. Those who did amazing things for God. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. They're there cheering us on saying, go for it. Keep running. Keep facing the battles. Keep fighting. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How can we run with patience? How can we finish our course well? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author, the beginner, and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ finished his course. And he says, lean on me. I will get you through. Rely on my strength. I will lead you safely through the course. And you'll arrive at home. Paul has fought. Paul has finished. And Paul has been faithful. He's been faithful. I have fought a good fight. Second uh, Timothy 2, 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. That, that phrase could have two meanings to it. I think both are, are good to examine. <clears throat> First, it could mean that he has faithfully declared the gospel and guarded its truth. He has kept it. He has guarded it. He has protected the truth of the gospel. See, Paul constantly taught the word and made sure that those who came after him did as well. Look at what he's told Timothy in this book alone, in this letter alone. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.13, he says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. He says, hold fast to those, Timothy. Make sure that you are teaching the word, that you are protecting it, that you're holding fast to that sound doctrine. Chapter 2, verse 15, study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He says, Timothy, you've got to get in this word. You've got to study it. You've got to make sure that you are protecting it. So in order to do that, you've got to make sure you know what it says. You've got to rightly divide it. Chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, he says, Timothy, you've seen it in me, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconia, Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them the Lord delivered me. He says, Timothy, you've seen it in me. You've seen me protecting the faith. You've seen my doctrine. You've seen my lifestyle. Now get it in you and protect it as well. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Paul was constantly teaching the word and holding it safe for those who came after him and teaching them to do the same. Paul confronted false doctrine everywhere he went, whenever and wherever he heard it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. I love this one. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. The Galatians 
were, were led astray by those Judaizers who said, well, yeah, you can accept Christ, but in order to fully accept Christ, you then have to keep the Old Testament law as well. Paul says, no. He says, that's false doctrine. He says, you don't have to do that. It's Christ and Christ alone. He confronted that false doctrine. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 11 it says, as ye have known how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. He was constantly writing to them. Read through the book of 1 Corinthians. It's time and time again, chapter after chapter after chapter of saying, Corinthians, you need to get this right. This is false teaching among you. Till we come to chapter 11, verse 34. It says, if any man hunger, let him eat at home. This is speaking at this part uh, about the, the Lord's Supper, about communion. That ye come not together into condemnation. And the rest, while well, I said in order when I come. He's got 11 chapters where he has written instruction and correction of, against false doctrine in 1 Corinthians. And he finally says, you know what? This is the last thing. Everything else I'll set in order when I see you next, when I come to you next. He was constantly confronting false doctrine. And that's what he says in, in chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Paul faced the Galatian legalists, the Colossian Gnostics, and everywhere he went, the Judaizers, who said, oh, it's Christ plus the Old Testament law. It's Christ plus circumcision. It's Christ plus the Sabbath. And Paul was saying, no, it's Christ and Christ alone. So he has faithfully declared the gospel and guarded its truth. He says, I have, I have kept the faith. But there's another possible meaning to this. And that is that Paul has faithfully fulfilled his divine calling in this world. See, when Paul was first commissioned by Christ on the road to, on the road to Damascus, Jesus told Ananias what Paul would face. We see this in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. This is, this is Jesus speaking to Ananias. When Ananias is like, no, God, I'm not going to go to Paul. He's, he's persecuting the church. What's going on? I, I, do, you, do you really know who that guy is? Verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul has accomplished that. Paul reached the Gentiles in both Asia and Europe through his three missionary journeys and his many letters. He was constantly writing to them. He was constantly thinking about them, praying for them. He was constantly willing to go to them. Paul reached the Gentiles. Paul preached before dignitaries. He pre preached before Felix, Felix in Acts 24. He preached before Festus in Acts 25. He preached before King Agrippa in Acts 20, uh, 25 as well. And possibly by this point, he may have already preached before Nero. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, we'll get to uh, hopefully next week, <clears throat> says, at my first answer or my first defense, my first apologia, no man stood with me but all men forsook me. I pray that God, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. He's saying, I've already given my first defense of why I'm in prison. It could be that he's, uh, it, it is most likely speaking of this time here in 2 Timothy when he was in prison the second time. It was probably before Nero that he was presented and gave his defense. That wicked, wicked man who would ultimately call for his execution. So Paul has preached to the Gentiles. He has preached to dignitaries. And he has suffered many things for the name of Christ. You realize in 2 Corinthians chapter 10.10, 10, this, this is an amazing one. We don't often hear about this one. 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, uh, Paul is addressing those who are fighting against him says, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. They're like, man, Paul, Paul writes really well. They're weighty and powerful, have good arguments. It's hard to confront those. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Said, but 
He, his, his writing is great, but have you seen the man? Have you, have you seen him? He's, he's a small, frail little thing, and he doesn't speak very well. He's, he's, his appearance is poor, and his speech is unpolished. He speaks like a country hick almost. He was mocked for those things. He experienced many hardships and sufferings. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 27, we've read these many times. It says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times I received forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often in perils of water in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often in hunger and thirst, and fastings often in cold and nakedness. This is what Paul suffered. He has fulfilled his divine calling when Christ first said, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So the question is, well, how? How has Paul been able to face all of this and still keep the faith? Well, I think it's three things. It was first because he knew who his faith was in or in whom was his faith. We see this in 2 Timothy 1.12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Paul says, I know whom my faith is in. I know it's in Christ. I know Christ will not fail me. He will not forsake me and he will not leave me to be ashamed. Paul knew who his faith was in he was able to face these things, second, because he knew what he would hear. Paul knew the moment when that axe blade flashed in the sun, <laughs> ending his life, that he'd see his Christ. And he would hear those words of Matthew 25, 21. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. He knew what he would hear. Paul could face these things. He could keep the faith because he knew what he would receive. And that's our point C. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. See, we see Paul's award. We see his accomplishments, uh, his acknowledgement, his accomplishments. See Paul's award. He's going to get one of these. He's going to get the crown. He's going to receive the crown of, of righteousness. I look cool now, don't I? Okay, maybe not quite. That, Paul said there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Wow. It's his award. We see three points under here. It is first, it is reserved. It is reserved. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. It already had his name on it. He's like, nah, -uh, you're not getting mine. It's reserved for me. Don't you love when you um, make arrangements for your, you and your wife to go out for dinner? And you call ahead and you make those arrangements. You make those reservations. And you get to the restaurant and you see that long line out the door. You're like, man, this, this is going to take forever to get everybody through here. And you get to walk past every single buddy, every single person in the line. You say, hey, my name is, is so-and-so. I have a reservation for this time for a table for two. And your wife nudges you. You say, you see that line? Good thing you called ahead. Make sure wives, you, you acknowledge your husband. They need that. We need that ego boost. Um, we're frail creatures. We 
have that table reserved for us. Paul said, I have a crown reserved for me. Nobody's going to take it. It's mine. It is saved up for me. It's got my name on it. And it's waiting for me. The moment I enter eternity, I get to see my Christ. I get to be with Him forever. And He's going to reward me. He's going to say, Paul, this is your award. You have kept the faith. This is for you. It is reserved. Second, it is, it is righteousness. It is a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day. Uh, gotquestions.org is one of my favorite resources. Uh, there's, there's thousands of articles of, of solid biblical teachings, of, of answering questions that you have about the faith. And uh, this is, is from the five, hev- what are the five heavenly crowns that believers can receive in heaven? The third one is the crown of righteousness. There's, there's the imperishable crown in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25. The crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. The crown of glory, uh, 1 Peter 5, 4. And the crown of life, Revelation 2, 10. But the, the, the crown of righteousness from 2 Timothy 2, 4. It says, we will inherit this crown through the righteousness of Christ, which is what gives us a right to it. It is Christ's righteousness. And without which, without the righteousness of Christ, it cannot be attained. Because it is obtained and possessed in a righteous way and not by force and deceit as earthly crowns sometimes are, it is an everlasting crown promised to all who love the Lord and eagerly wait for His return. Though our enduring uh, through our enduring heart discouragements, persecutions, sufferings, or even death, we know assuredly our reward is with Christ in eternity. This crown is not for those who depend on, upon their own sense of righteousness or their own works. Such an attitude breeds only arrogance and pride, not a longing, a fervent desire to be with the Lord. Have you felt that? Have you felt that fervent desire to be with the Lord? Paul says, this is a righteous crown because it is Christ's own righteousness. We've been washed with his blood and declared righteous. We have a right standing with God. There's nothing that needs to be paid. There's no uh, uh, penalty any longer for us. We have a right standing with God. Don't you love when you when you uh, have a bill that you have to pay off, whether it be a credit card bill or a, a mortgage or whatever it is, and you finally make that last payment, no longer are you in debt. You have a right standing with the bank. And that's us with Christ. Through his payment on the cross, we no longer have a debt to God. That payment has been made in full. We stand righteous before him today. And we will one day have a crown of righteousness that we can cast at his feet, reflect his glory better because of his righteousness. But third and finally for tonight, we see that this crown, Paul's award, it has requirements. It is reserved and it is righteousness, but it has requirements. Paul says, and not to me only. Well, and that's encouraging. Paul's not saying, well, I'm the super Christian, so I get a crown. Good luck to the rest of you. He says, no, it's not just for me. Yes, mine has my name on it, but you can have one too. Here's the requirement. But unto all them that love his appearing. Those that love his appearing, those that eagerly, fervently wait for him to come back for us. What a glorious thing. Can you feel it getting closer? Can you feel that trumpet about to call? When Christ steps out of eternity and steps into the clouds and catches us up forever to be with him. Boy, what a glorious day. I can't wait for it. I I love that song. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. 
what a great thing. I can't wait for that day. And I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the past month and said, this world's getting dark. This world is not how it was even five, ten years ago. This is, as Pastor Serba used to always say, this is not my father's world anymore. His, his earthly father. It's not his world anymore. It looks vastly different than that. Because there's an apostasy. There's a falling away of the church. There's the wickedness of the world. Read through the beginning of 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3. All the things that we read and studied through there of what's coming, of what the world will look like. That looks like our world today. Paul said he was in the last time. And if he was in the last days, then we're in the last, last days. He's coming soon. We need to be looking for it. Eagerly awaiting to love his appearing. But in loving his appearing, knowing that the appearing of Christ is eminent, it could occur at any moment, we need to be prepared for it. Jesus gave the parable of, of the ten virgins and how some of them weren't ready and they were put to shame. We need to be those wise virgins who trim their lamps, who prepare their oil, who are ready for his appearing. We need to make sure that we're not caught in sin when he appears. How how embarrassing would that be? That the moment Christ comes back, that long-awaited return, we're in wickedness and sin. The only way to prevent that is to live a holy life. To live every moment in expectation of His return. And when we are so focused on that, oh, that light's out. When we're so focused on that, oh, look, a squirrel. We're not going to be focused on the things of this world. When I'm so focused on this crown of righteousness, I'm not going to be focused on what I want. I'm going to be focused on what Christ wants. When I'm focused on what Christ wants, I'm going to fight for the faith. When I'm focused on what Christ wants, I'm going to finish my course. I'm not going to give up halfway and say, well, I suppose that's good enough. I'll get my participation award. I'm going to finish the course. And when I'm focused on what Christ wants, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to keep the faith, just like Paul. So Paul's last words should ultimately be our last words. I'm ready to be offered up. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. We're going to mess up at times. We're sinful people. We're sinful creatures. We're sinners. But when we do, we need to make sure that we turn and confess that sin to Christ. Restore that relationship. Make sure there's nothing hindering it. We should be able to come to communion this Wednesday night and not have to say, oh, hold up, I need longer at this time of confession because I've, it's been so long but that we naturally flow through the communion time and take a moment to confess those last sins and move on because we're living a holy life, not through our power, but through Christ's power, through His strength and for His glory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Questions? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank You for Paul's last words for the encouragement that they give us, that it's doable. That we, through your power, which is the same power that Paul did it through, can accomplish those same goals. But Father, it's also a challenge. It's a challenge to live every day in expectation of the return of Christ. To live every day as if it's our last. 
to live every day holy so that you receive the most glory is that when Christ returns, we're not caught in sin, but that we are eagerly loving and expecting his return for us. Lord, may it be soon. We pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen.